Good afternoon and welcome to the ARL webcast, using ARL salary data to establish and maintain an equitable salary structure for faculty, faculty librarians. This is the third in a series of four webcasts highlighting effective uses of data from the ARL annual salary survey. I'm Amy Yeager of ARL, filling in today for Martha Kira Levy. I'd like to go over a few logistical items first. Um, first, as you heard, everyone has been muted to cut down on background noise. Uh, but we welcome your questions. Uh, please type them in the chat box and the speakers will address them throughout the presentation. A recording of this webcast will be posted on ARL's YouTube channel in a few days. And slides and supporting documents will be available in the University of Florida Institutional Repository. We will provide URLs for these sites later in the broadcast. Uh, the webcasts in this series highlight uses of data from the ARL Annual Salary Survey which reports salaries for more than 12,000 professional positions in the 125 ARL member libraries. The survey also tracks minority representation in ARL libraries in the United States and reports separate data for health sciences and law libraries. Uh, the series is conceived and hosted by Martha Kiralidu, who is Senior Director of Statistics and Service Quality Programs at ARL. Uh, Martha, unfortunately, is unable to be with us today, but I know she's here with us in spirit. Uh, today's speakers are Judy Rutenberg, Program Director for Transforming Research Libraries at ARL, and Brian Keith, Associate Dean for Administrative Services and Faculty Affairs at the University of Florida Libraries. On today's agenda, Judy will first provide an overview of ARL's Transforming Research Libraries program. Then Brian will give an in-depth demonstration of how he used data from the ARL Salary Survey to implement a salary structure for faculty librarians at the University of Florida. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Judy Rudenberg of ARL. Thank you, Amy. I'm so pleased to be here today. Transforming Research Libraries focuses primarily on the often dramatic changes in the practices of research and teaching in the digital age that compel research libraries to examine and transform our services, our collections, and our workforce. Martha asked me to say a few words on today's webcast because TRL has been strategically focused on workforce transformation for several years. By looking at the new roles library professionals play in research institutions, new services they offer, and new skills required of those professionals. Our organizations approach workforce transformation by developing, retraining, and reskilling their existing staff, bringing in new talent with diverse educational and work experiences, or both. For these transformative strategies to be successful, research libraries need tools, best practices, and data. Brian's presentation today brings together the data ARL gathers in its salary survey with a systematic, transparent method to rationalize compensation management critical human resources instrument. As we bring new kinds of professionals into our organizations and develop a system-wide understanding of the new competencies librarians need, such evidence-based human resources practices become even more essential. It is my great pleasure to turn the mic over to Brian Keith. And thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, this is uh, Brian Keith from the University of Florida, and I am very excited uh, to uh, be participating in this webinar and uh, just to make sure uh, that uh, we provide you with the link uh, we're going to do it on the uh, front end uh, all of the slides uh, and there are a lot of them and the documents that I reference and the spreadsheets that I'm actually going to be opening up and showing you are available at uh, this link and that's the University of Florida's institutional repository, and we'll share this link with you after the webinar. Also, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, recording of this webcast uh, will be available online, and you can find it through ARL's uh, YouTube channel, and this is the link for that, and we'll provide that uh, for you uh, also. And before we get started, I'd, I'd like to talk about um, the importance of compensation programs and, uh, and just kind of focuses on uh, what comp compensation programs are designed to do. And they support a wide variety of uh, human resources functions and institutional needs. 
and I, my intention is to touch on all of these uh, as we uh, as I go through my presentation. I hope you also will notice um, a, an author's name uh, at the bottom uh, right hand corner of my slide. Uh, one of the things I'm going to provide uh, are references, and where I'm using other people's works, I am citing them uh, by uh, providing the author's name. In this session, I'm going to start off with some concepts of equity and fairness, um, the elements and terminology that we use in salary plan design. Uh, for some folks, this will be a review. For some folks, this will be maybe um, applying concrete terms to um, some concepts uh, that you just implicitly have. And then I'm going to move on to the experiences at the UF libraries and uh, the processes and uh, key decisions that uh, we took part in in coming up with a salary structure that is a ref reference to the external market um, using the ARL salary survey data. And why am I going to tell you guys about the University of Florida libraries and our process for librarian salary structure design? Because I think it illustrates those concepts that compensation plans um, are geared towards. Uh, it also, um, I think, demonstrates some decisions and processes and outcomes that um, other institutions might experience. And also, uh, because the resulting system, I think, is, is uh, useful uh, for folks to, to see because it cr has created a, a transparent and maintainable uh, system, but also one uh, where I think our process and the design can be transferred to other institutions uh, where you could take elements of it or the whole thing or you could customize it to make sense um, and I, I hope you agree with that assessment at the end. The last uh, thing that I'm going to share with you are the references. And so some of the concepts behind an equitable salary structure um, are the ideas of equity and fairness. And there are, uh, the literature uh, tells us there are a variety of different types of equity and fairness. And um, the first uh, type is an external equity. And that's how uh, our, the way we pay positions within our individual organizations, how that compares to other uh, organizations. Uh, the next is uh, internal, uh, how different job types within our own organization compare to each other. And so when I'm using the term internal or external uh, equity, uh, this is uh, what I'm describing. But there are other less commonly used um, or cited forms of equity. And the first is individual equity. And this is how uh, individuals based on uh, their uh, performance are paid compared to other people who do similar work in the same organization. And then there's also personal equity, which is based upon a person's perception of their own worth. Uh, for fairness, there's distributive fairness, which is uh, the way in which pay is allocated by an organization and the perceived equity of that process. And um, then there's also um, procedural, uh, which is the decision making uh, that goes into and the procedures that are used to distribute pay. Um, and we focus typically more on distributive, uh, but the research has shown that procedural fairness is uh, considered the most important to employees uh, when they're uh, determining how satisfied they are with their pay. And individual equity, which is how um, uh, folks uh, uh, are paid by their own perceptions, the second most important. Um, to continue with procedural fairness, um, the literature shows us that this has a strong influence on whether employees uh, view their organization as trustworthy and um, whether they consider them to value uh, their employees. And so um, obviously uh, the processes by which we manage compensation um, are, are key. These, these perceptions of fairness can be increased through uh, consistent processes uh, by uh, designing systems that uh, afford participation uh, by employees, uh, by having good communication practices, and also having an opportunity for people to redress uh, issues or perceived inequity. And moving on to salary administration, 
There are three fundamental issues that uh, entities try and address through their pay policies. The first is uh, setting pay levels in relation to other companies that's externally oriented, and then also evaluating individual jobs and determining the pay relationships between them and determining uh, the pay relationships between individual workers in the same jobs. And these are uh, concepts that are focused on internal equity. And these uh, issues um, can be effectively addressed through uh, well-designed salary structures. And what is a salary structure? It's the system where jobs of roughly equal value or worth are grouped into grades with competitive salary ranges. And an employer uh, may have multiple models or approaches within, uh, within this structure. And as I'll show in just a moment, the University of Florida Libraries has a number of salary structures. Why, uh, why is a formal uh, or well thought out salary structure, uh, should it be implemented? Because compensation decisions uh, made solely to uh, resolve individual uh, issues uh, or um, dissatisfaction on the part of employees create higher operating uh, costs for the enterprise and they also create an environment that rewards complaints. Uh, individual compensation arrangements also um, eventually are likely to become known to other employees and particularly if you're a public sector employee and can usually create some dissatisfaction. And by creating compensation guidelines uh, based upon uh, the norms, uh, before you recruit for a position, you can balance how much um, should we pay for a candidate um, and versus how much would it take to make this employee happy. And so it allows you to uh, reconcile the worth of the position versus trying to uh, game a salary offer. And even though uh, individual uh, managers um, may be responsible for costs, uh, there's a, a tendency amongst managers uh, to provide um, the highest pay possible uh, and ultimately in libraries and other entities uh, because they don't really suffer from these increased costs and they benefit from being considered a nice person. And when these individual managers can make decisions uh, without a structure, uh, every unit um, is likely to come up with its own uh, system um, or there's some variance uh, that makes it uh, where uh, the pay um, for comparable work in different units is uh, inequitable. And uh, the purpose of establishing a structure is to provide uh, organizational consistency and also um, to give people uh, reference as far as salary uh, for career development and predicting pay increases that they might receive as an incentive uh, for their work. Um, and both of these uh, go back to the prologue that I uh, started with. And so how do you, if I've sold you on the idea that you really need a salary structure, how do you actually develop a salary structure? The two key elements of it are uh, compensable factors and pay ranges. And a compensable factor is an attribute of a job that can be used uh, as a basis for determining the worth of the job. And uh, that might um, be uh, based upon uh, elements of the employee, uh, like experience uh, or um, particular education or training or skills or abilities, SKAs. Uh, that uh, are required and um, therefore you know the person sh or should receive compensation for them or they can be based upon the job and some of the common elements of a job that drive its compensation are uh, the supervisory responsibility uh, the amount of direct supervision received generally positions with more autonomy um, are more highly compensated the complexity of the work uh, it's um, the authority or impact and so these are probably um, pretty common factors um, that uh, most uh, most managers are used to thinking about but uh, for the purposes of this I, I think it's useful and, and for the examples I'm going to use later uh, to differentiate between an employee based compensable factor and a job based compensable factor and if you're going to use compensable factors it requires uh, some decisions regarding weight 
uh, and also degrees or level. And a really straightforward example for degrees or levels would be education uh, attained. And that could be an AA, a BS, a master's degree, um, maybe an MLS degree in your environment is worth more than other master's degrees. Um, but these are pretty straightforward uh, degrees. Um, but if you wanted to have a system that rewards uh, education and length of experience, uh, then you have to come up with uh, weights for those factors. And um, so those are two uh, key decisions regarding compensable factors that permits them to be used to actually calculate uh, compensation. And another key term uh, concept for designing salary plans is a pay range, the minimum and maximum uh, base rate of pay uh, for employees in a job. And um, it's often expressed in pay grades. Uh, and the, an important element of pay ranges is the range width. And this is the percentage uh, difference between the minimum to the maximum, the minimum compensation that makes sense for a position and uh, the maximum uh, that it makes sense to pay for someone doing a type of positions. Uh, these vary, uh, but typically they're narrower for lower pay grades. Um, for professional level positions, they tend to be broader. And the rate minimums obviously um, have to be uh, good enough to, uh, quali to attract qualified candidates. Uh, and the maximums um, should be effective at rewarding and retaining high achievers. And so these concepts uh, were part of the consideration uh, in dividing, de, de, um, defining our system at the University of Florida. So you'll see these in play in a little bit. And then uh, there's uh, range progression. And this is the difference in, uh, or the jump from one grade to the next. And this um, is probably pretty common um, in uh, libraries in the library assistant, library associate, um, in those series as you progress. Um, they um, vary uh, by position type. They're typically smaller for lower pay grades, and they tend to be larger uh, for professional employees. And um, they need to be large enough to where um, they are effective in compensating people for uh, progression and differentiating uh, different job types. And at the University of Florida, we have a range progression uh, for our librarians. Um, as you'll see later, we have ranks and uh, promotion from one rank to the next um, has a longstanding uh, reward associated with of a 9% increase at the University of Florida. And a next uh, key element which you'll see uh, used um, in our model is a range midpoint uh, for um, uh, positions uh, that are um, comparable. You use this to, uh, for people who are in those positions, uh, you use this to distribute uh, the salaries um, for those individuals uh, where uh, this is the center of the distribution and uh, people uh, that have more experience, for example, uh, would be distributed above that midpoint typically. Uh, people with uh, other compensable factors uh, would be, based upon their individual values, um, would be uh, above or below this midpoint. I'll show you what a distribution of this kind looks like. Uh, when I get into the University of Florida example. Uh, generally, uh, for white collar workers, the midpoint represents the jobs market value. And um, you'll see that we use for our midpoints uh, uh, a function of the average from the ARL salary survey. And once you've designed a system and you've created one that you feel is equitable, competitive, you have to be willing to adhere to it or there's really not a program at all. Um, you had a market equity initiative or something along those lines versus an actual system. And you maintain the integrity of a salary structure through the ways in which you administer recruiting, um, counter offers for current employees, uh, the way you handle promotions, lateral moves, uh, and the way you, do, um, you handle merit and across the board increases. Um, that's what ATB means, uh, across the board. And I'll show you and discuss some examples of those in, uh, when I get to the University of Florida. And so uh, I wanted to address some of the concepts and some of the vocabulary that I would be using later. And having uh, achieved that, I um, am now going to move on to the University of Florida. And just to orient you to the UF libraries, um, the George A. Smathers Libraries comprises the main campus and the medical libraries for the University of Florida. Uh, there are uh, a, 
about 84 at the time of this market equity uh, uh, process. Uh, there were about 84 faculty uh, and uh, about 169 professional and paraprofessional staff and uh, a large number of students for a total population of about 417. For the librarians, uh, the majority of our uh, uh, librarians are 12 months, though we do have some um, other types of employees. And our librarians break into, or our library faculty break into three uh, rank series. And we have assistant INS and assistant university librarians. Uh, the assistant IN uh, is the first uh, in of the non-tenure accruing series. Um, the assistant UL is the first in the um, three uh, ranks for uh, tenure accruing uh, library uh, faculty. And so um, what you'll see is that we have some folks uh, in, the, uh, in the first uh, rank, which is assistant, uh, about 26. And then we have almost um, about one and a half times that in our middle category, people who've made it to the associate level. And then in the highest rank, we have a relatively um, small number of people who have promoted um, through that process. Um, the way people promote through ranks is through accomplishment in uh, their primary responsibilities, um, scholarship and professional development, and the third criteria is service. And uh, so these do not, um, these progressions do not necessarily reflect changes in assignments, um, but it's, um, the, it's a progression um, through uh, the career. And uh, we have a number of salary systems at the University of Florida. By my count, we have seven. And we have ones for library assistants and associates uh, that are here called library types. And then for other staff employees, we have, um, uh, for people who are uh, IT professionals, we have a salary structure for those folks. And we also have uh, for um, positions that are not either library assistants or associates, uh, but or IT positions, but are other um, important uh, paraprofessional or professional positions like accounting or grants management or clerical, um, we have a system uh, for us determining salaries for those. Um, for library faculty, we have a system for our um, associate deans and deans, and then we have a system for uh, that handles the compensation for the administ administrative responsibilities for chairs and associate chairs, and then we also have a um, system um, for all other uh, all other library faculty. And these are circled in red because these um, are the ones that I'm going to focus on today. Um, regrettably, I will not have time um, to address all seven of these, though they are all have their own fascinating stories to tell. Um, I will um, be uh, talking about uh, our stipends for chairs and associate chairs and our base salaries for library faculty. And so Historically, library faculty uh, salary administration at the University of Florida uh, was not managed perfectly. Uh, we had compression. Uh, there were also um, inconsistent salary decisions that were based upon uh, ranks where um, we looked at what all of the associate university librarians were being made, were being paid, and we tried to uh, to consider uh, variations from measures of central tendency. Um, and there were assumptions about the market demand for certain types of jobs or what their worth was. Um, and this was not a um, systematic uh, process. And there was uh, a lack of transparency. So these were issues uh, that uh, when I came to work at the Smathers Libraries in 2005, and when our dean came to work uh, at the Smathers Libraries in 2007, uh, these were areas that we um, hoped to address. And so in 2008, a joint committee was formed, and it was charged with establishing a, a market equity design that would be internally and externally um, equitable. Uh, and um, the uh, final report, uh, this is an actual uh, link. Uh, when you get the slides, you can go to the, the report and check it out yourself. Um, that was delivered uh, in March of 2009. A joint committee in the um, vernacular of the University of Florida Libraries is a committee that is um, made up of membership that is elected by the librarians and also appointed by the faculty. 
and our chair uh, was our uh, of the committee was the chair of our cataloging department, and um, she um, did a, a, a remarkable job of uh, of shepherding the process, and and I was uh, happy to also be a member of the committee. Um, and there were some important findings that came out of the work of that joint committee. Uh, the first was to validate that the um, ARL salary survey uh, is a serviceable uh, system uh, for orienting towards the uh, external market. And uh, the other was uh, within the uh, ARL um, salary survey and based upon its data that uh, the committee felt that uh, we should look at uh, the public university libraries uh, in the United States and that those were really the peers uh, for the University of Florida and who we competed against. They also, um, our committee, arrived at a decision that instead of just using the average uh, salaries that are um, provided, and I'll show you one of the tables um, where uh, ARL provides an average salary, these um, tend to include uh, people with administrative responsibilities uh, and uh, so it, up to and including directors. And uh, we felt uh, in looking at the data that, uh, first of all, that wasn't really the target group. We have a stipend system uh, by which um, we assign administrative uh, salaries in addition to base salaries uh, for library faculty. But also, um, beyond that, uh, it, it being a little bit outside of the scope, there was also the issue where deans and directors' salaries uh, did not seem to have the same trends as uh, the salaries for other folks if you looked at regions. For example, in the South Atlantic, um, the, the deans and directors' salaries uh, tended to be um, higher than other regions, but generally the salaries for the South Atlantic for rank and file librarians uh, tended to be lower. So, for a variety of reasons, um, we, the committee determined that we should look at um, uh, non-administrative types of librarian uh, salary data. And the um, committee also um, felt that you could start with the averages in the system, uh, in, in the salary survey, and you could use that as a basis of a system, but really for internal equity, uh, once you had that linkage to the outside, you would need to come up with some uh, UF-defined uh, compensable factors, such as advanced degrees. Um, there are a number of our librarians that have uh, PhDs, and the idea uh, was that if they were applicable, they should be compensable. Uh, there are also um, a limited number of our positions that require uncommon skills. One of them that was um, identified was foreign language fluency. Um, also discussed amongst the committee was um, music, um, the ability to read music, and then also um, yet the, there was the uh, discussion that um, some subject areas such as uh, engineering uh, might you know, be relatively uncommon skills that should be considered. But there was a pretty consistent understanding that that should at least be applied uh, to foreign language. Uh, the, um, also, there was a, a, a decision uh, and recommendation from this committee that we should take into account uh, differences in rank that university librarians should generally make more than the other ranks that associates should generally make more than assistants and that length of service um, was uh, shown in the uh, salary uh, data uh, to be an important determinant uh, and in reviewing uh, the data in the system uh, became, uh, we were able to calculate uh, that the midpoint for the distribution for the ARL data uh, tended to be in the experience band of 12 to 15 years. You'll see more on this in just a moment. Uh, but, and this was also the average uh, years of experience for uh, UF librarians. And so as we were creating a new system, it, it kind of looked like we might be able to um, distribute our range of experience over the years of service uh, data that's in the ARL uh, salary survey. You'll see this in just a moment. And additionally, uh, the idea was that um, the, the rank uh, of associate university librarian uh, was the midpoint, as I showed you before. That's where most of our librarians are. It's, um, it's associated, it's intended to be a mid-career point. 
And um, so the idea was that we should take into account the rank and um, that the midpoint of our rank structure would need to be uh, at the University of Florida, the associate university librarian rank. And the joint committee uh, also uh, uh, pointed out that performance is an important component of equitable salaries. And uh, the, the dot, dot, dot underlined in red um, is for effect. Um, I was on the committee, and that's pretty much as far as the committee was willing to go. Um, they um, were unwilling to, um, and, and it was, they were not in a position to make decisions about the weight that should be given to performance, and so they deferred on that. And so in establishing this new salary structure, because we were, it became uh, clear beyond the charge that really we were uh, going to come up with something uh, quite different um, that, uh, and, and, and create it new, that there were a lot of, these were important concepts that had come out of this committee, but it was really going to fall to the administration of the libraries to come up with a proposal, uh, a design um, for discussion on, how, on, on what the salary structure would actually look like. And so uh, when I looked at the salary survey uh, while I was on the committee and then afterwards, um, you know, there, were some, there were some really great things about the ARL salary survey. Uh, and the first is that it's comprehensive. Um, it covers um, the wide variety of uh, professional level uh, work, um, including a lot of functional areas, HR positions, IT positions. Um, and then um, there's also, um, I believe, almost 100% uh, participation amongst ARLs. And um, the ARLs are uh, the peers of the University of Florida. So these are really important pluses. There's a large data pool, uh, and so the uh, idea uh, in using uh, statistics based upon a population in the thousands uh, makes it more of a valid. Uh, and then um, there's also um, uh, in the position-specific data, uh, there are um, descriptions, and you know, the assumption is that those are used consistently by the people who submit the data. Um, I know many of the HR officers, and um, so the idea was that we could um, we could rely on them um, because the, they would be um, uh, legitimate uh, data for certain types of position. The other advantage is it's updated annually. We have revisited it, um, and it's easy to rework the figures um, to the current year data. Um, the committee had used 0809. We implemented based on 0910, and that's those are the statistics I'm going to be pointing to. Uh, and it also includes data from law and medical libraries. Um, medical uh, libraries report um, through our dean. Uh, the law library reports through uh, the dean there. But it's still useful um, you know, if the Legal Information Center were ever to want to look into adopting our system. Plus, the data is accessible. Uh, you can go online as an ARL, and you can actually get the data, which we spend a lot of time manipulating. All of these factors, in my opinion, uh, just it's it is the go-to um, point of reference um, for ARL institutions, in my opinion. But it's not perfect. There, the tables are numerous, um, but the statistics in the tables are limited for our purposes. Um, as I mentioned before, you couldn't just go uh, to table 25 and see what the average salary by region was, in our opinion, uh, because it had administrative positions. And there were some instances where the data we wanted to get to was in a table that ARL was producing for the you know, completely appropriate purpose of examining the difference between uh, pay for, um, for the two genders. And what we really wanted was just the statistics so we could use it to calculate an average. And you know, so there's some manipulation um, that you need to, uh, to do. And I've provided a link of uh, where the 0910 um, salary survey is if you actually want to look at the tables. The other challenge are the job codes. And I know ARL is, uh, has done some work uh, refining these, and, um, and, and I think that's terrific. I'm, I um, am very excited to see what the statistics come out every year uh, when those changes. But the job codes that were in existence in 0910, and to a certain extent there's some legacy of this, uh, for the majority of our positions, they handle some of the responsibilities in three categories. They're public services. They provide reference, both general and specialized. 
and we also consider them subject specialists. Um, but someone may be a subject specialist that does all of these things. Um, they may provide specialized reference and bibliographic services, but there are a lot of people that historically we've considered subject specialists that do not primarily build collections. And we spend a lot of time um, struggling with how to interpret those three words. I'm not going to belabor it here um, because essentially what we ended up doing was uh, merging these job codes. We'll see that in a moment. And so without further ado, I'm going to get into the analysis. And so what this part is going to require is for me to flip back and forth into actual spreadsheets and to show you our calculation. As I mentioned before, the spreadsheets are available. Um, and uh, you can um, see them. You can see the actual calculations. And uh, based upon feedback, um, I've also uh, provided a primer on uh, weighted averages because we use those quite a bit, um, in, in, as you'll see. And um, so if you're not familiar with that or it's been a long time since you've um, calculated a weighted average, uh, this will, uh, th th there's an a example that will get you up to speed on that. And um, so I'm going to start off um, uh, with table 25, but we're really going to bounce around amongst the, um, the, the tables that were of interest to us from the ARL salary survey. And the first is, the, is um, table 25, looking at the average salary by position and region. Uh, then we also look at table 26, figure 5, and table 20. And again, I have a link to where you can get to these actual tables in their rough form. Um, and so when we were, um, we, one of the primary things we wanted to look at, and we always work backwards to, is what should, what should our uh, pay be um, based upon our region? And so um, we derived this from table 25, which is a table that's intended to provide that. Uh, but we um, established uh, what we call core librarian positions for the purpose of the salary. And um, if you were to go um, to this link, and I'm going to open up the spreadsheet that you would find there, and look at the worksheet calculation of regional factor, you will see the following. All right. Calculation of regional factor. And so this is the data, and as I mentioned, um, one of the great things about ARL is they provide the data. This is the data for table 25 uh, that is in uh, these range of cells. And um, so these are the actual figures that are in the table. But one of the great things about um, the ARL statistics is they also provide us the background, which are the number of, um, of salaries uh, that were entered that actually resulted in this average. So for example, um, the average uh, for New England for a functional specialist is 72,734. Um, we know that there were 315 positions that actually went into that. And so um, this is a scaled down version. I've taken out the administrative positions and only included the core um, positions. If you could see me, you could see me doing the um, quotation marks with my fingers. Uh, the core librarians, which are functional specialists, subject specialists, reference, cataloging, and other. And um, ARL provides these uh, broken down um, by age bands. That wasn't particularly of use to us, uh, but the fact that we have all of this statistics, um, we use that to um, come up with an average for the South Atlantic. So the first thing we do is we start with the raw data on average salaries. Um, as I mentioned, we're also provided with the number of salaries that are represented in those averages. And um, so by calculating, uh, by multiplying the average for each cell by the number of uh, the um, salaries that were used to calculate that, we're able to come up with the total salary uh, for each of these uh, regions for each of these position types or years. And this is, if, if you can bear with me, uh, what we end up with is the ability to calculate a weighted average for each region. And so without knowing the individual um, salaries, but by knowing the weight, how many proportionally went into each of these uh, cells, we're able to come up with a weighted average uh, which should bear the same result as if we were calculating an average on all of these um, actual figures. 
And so the weighted average for salaries for all of these core librarian positions for the South Atlantic is 58,000. And um, we calculated that for every region. Um, you'll see the highest is for New England. And um, we also calculated that for all of the positions that were included uh, in this table. Um, and that is the average for all of the United States is 62,000. By dividing um, each of these uh, regional weighted average by the national weighted average, we're able to come up with a, um, pers with a factor that represents how these different regions relate to the national average. And to cut to the chase, the South Atlantic for these types of positions in 09-010 uh, paid on average 94 cents on the dollar compared to the national average. So what this allowed us to do was to use, if we were so inclined, to work backwards to our region, and these are regions that are defined by ARL, uh, to work back to our region and to um, use national um, averages and to determine what our relevant market is. And so that was the first thing we calculated. We validated what the South Atlantic uh, should pay. I always do that. I always go to the wrong one. And so, um, we, as I mentioned, we established core librarians and we calculated a regional factor. And so the next thing that we did was to calculate average um, salaries for subject specialists, reference, public services, catalogers, and technical services. And we derived this from pay, table 26, which is the average salaries for U.S. librarians and based on years of experience. So I'm going to go back to my spreadsheet. Weighted average. And so um, we have for the subject specialist, public services, uh, technical services, references, and catalogers. These were the salaries that were provided in Table 26. Uh, and if you were to go to Table 26 and 0910, you would see these figures. Um, also online um, through ARL, you're able to get the number of salaries uh, that um, feed into, uh, it, that were used to establish these averages. And so um, by following the same process to establish weighted averages, multiplying the average salary by the weight or the number of, um, of figures that were used to arrive at that, um, and then by um, averaging uh, those figures. So um, you are able to um, come up with weighted averages for technical services, catalogers, and subject specialist references and public services, which our decision, because these at the University of Florida libraries are so integrated, our decision was to merge these. And so basically what we have is the average that's represented. Now, ARL wanted to depict um, the average for these positions over for each of these um, periods of experience. And that's an interesting thing, and we used it later. But what we wanted to do was to arrive at what is the average salary for a technical services position, a cataloging position, and, and for a merged subject specialist reference and public services. And then uh, once we arrived at that weighted average, we applied our South Atlantic factor of 94%. Okay. And so this is working us to the concept of do different types of librarianship based upon these um, salary surveys, do they get paid differently? Um, and then the next is uh, we um, wanted to look at the averages for the functional specialist. Um, in figure five, you, you, I hope you guys are following me. Uh, there's a significant amount of calculations in determining what the averages were for catalogers and technical services, for example. The functional specialists are my favorite um, because these are much more straightforward. These are just provided in figure five. And so we started with a mean uh, for positions that vary from uh, archivists, curators, to business managers. I have always been suspicious of why HR uh, managers are amongst the highest average salaries and we're the ones that submit the data, but that's a topic for a different webinar. Um, and so these are other areas um, where we have representation amongst our uh, librarians. And um, so you take that, uh, what we did was we took that average and we applied, again, this South Atlantic factor and um, tried to work these backwards to a relevant central measure of salaries that made sense for um, our region. All right. Next up, 
uh, we calculated um, ex um, experience and we um, wanted to establish uh, the um, the experience midpoints and the fluctuations that we see uh, based upon um, experience and there's um, some great data uh, that's provided by ARL for that and what ARL provides us is um, a, a table uh, 20 uh, that for uh, US um, uh, for uh, librarians of different types it tells us on average what they make at different um, times in their career. Now the reason we didn't want to just use this data and we wanted to actually attempt to normalize it was I didn't really believe that these salaries should vary based upon length of experience for different positions and some of these were genuinely counterintuitive um, and it's just based upon the, the data and um, so we wanted to bundle the data to try and get better results. So for example if you were to go from in this year from 16 to 19 years of experience and jump up to 20 to 23 the statistics would show us that on average you should take a $345 cut in pay and we know that's not the case. Um, you can see that in other examples um, and so we, what we wanted to do was normalize it. So through the process that you guys have seen a couple times now of weighted averages and if you were to open up this spreadsheet you could see the calculations. But the process of weighted averages we were to able to come up with a weighted average for all of these positions for each of these bands 0 to 3, 4 to 7, all the way up to over 35. These are the bands used by ARL. And we were able to come up with an average and very similar to the way we did the national average um, for the purposes of regions, we came up with a national weighted average uh, for all of these positions and that was 62,000 and just over 62,000. That means all of these positions, all of these uh, 5,900 positions, um, the average salary was 62,000 and um, when you look at, uh, when you compare these uh, weighted average for each of these bands uh, for all position types in these core librarian types, when you compare that to the national average, you get some interesting figures. And the first thing is, once you get past the first couple of bands, these um, progress between three and six, typically about four uh, percent. Uh, they go up by about four percent, um, 0.04. And um, then early in the, the, there are some huge jumps early in, in the career cycle. And so um, th that's one thing that's interesting. But the factor of 1.0 uh, would be the central tendency. As we calculated before, the average length of experience is about 12 years. So not surprisingly, uh, near the center is uh, where the average salary of 62,000 is most closely hit. And that's the difference between 63 and 62. And so um, we thought that this um, range was pretty predictive and represented uh, something that we could, um, without a lot of controversy, say that each one of these represented a 4% increase. Um, so we start with the center of the distribution, which is 12 to 15 years, down 4% and up 4% for at every um, increase in experience. And then um, we also found, um, if you look at where um, someone with zero to three years, according to the salary surveys, would start, they would come in at 0.79 of um, the average salary. And so that became our minimum salary. You'll see this in just a moment. And um, the increase um, is predicted by the um, salary uh, data uh, to go from 0.79% or 79% of the mean to 87% of the mean. Um, based upon the jump from three to four years. And for us, one of the interesting numbers was the increase of about 9% from year seven to eight. And that is the point at which we expect people to promote from assistant to associate. So it was a happy, happy happenstance um, that it was a 9% increase uh, because that's what we see for rank promotions. And so moving on to the next thing, uh, what we found from this is that there are actual uh, variations between regions and types of entities. I didn't show you public versus private, but that also exists, and not surprisingly, privates pay more. Um, there's also um, our, our belief that the years of experience, as I showed you before, generally is a steady predictor of 4% increases. 
also a, um, an analysis that I'm not going to show is that um, if you compare uh, these statistics for medical librarians uh, to those that are provided by MLA, they tend to do better under ARL. And so the average salaries vary significantly by job type. And this was something that our joint committee um, happened on. Um, and basically, if you were to look at the South Atlantic midpoint um, for um, a variety of different sorts of positions, um, there is significant variance. And I'm not talking about uh, between where you're really getting into different career fields like IT, um, but if you were to look in between um, the differences between cataloging and tech services, for example. Um, and so our perception was that these are significant um, and that these, um, per the recommendation of the committee, uh, that these should be considered in salaries. And so um, some of the decisions that were necessary to create our salary structure were that we would use the South Atlantic and that we would use all libraries, not just the publics. And so we've apl we're applying a factor of um, about 94% to national averages. We would also come up with a base salary specific to each faculty member, and it would be based upon those types of um, compensable factors I described before, some specific ones to their jobs, like cataloger versus um, tech services versus IT expert, um, and then also um, some individually specific factors like experience, and I've shown you, you've got a hint of how we're going to apply that. Um, we also were go decided to merge um, some job types that are not um, combined in the ARL salary survey. Um, these are subject specialist reference and public services um, because there's a lot of overlap. No one that works for us does specifically one of these. And, um, and we were also, to be honest, the thought that people were interpreting subject specialists just be strictly those whose primary responsibilities are to um, build collections. We were skeptical. Um, we also um, decided that we would maintain separately um, stipends for our department chairs and our associate chairs, that these folks would have a base salary calculated and then whatever stipend they received would be in addition to that. Uh, we also decided that, um, the, that each faculty members um, would not only have the job type, but that we would also give a 9% increase if foreign language was required. One of the recommendations was that unique positions should drive um, higher compensation. Um, and our decision was to limit that only to foreign language, not music, which I thought was an interesting decision, um, and not other types of uh, technical positions. And you'll see how that decision plays out in just a moment. And then um, the uh, salary um, for each faculty member would also have some individual compensable factors, their rank, um, assistant, associate, or UL, um, and we would start with that associate in either factor up or down, and you'll see this in just a moment. And then also length of service using the 4% increase um, that we see from ARL. And so the resulting salary structure um, is such, and my hope is that you can see this. I'm going to zoom out for just a moment. And basically, um, and then I'll zoom back in so you can see, basically we start with a midpoint that is in this column. Um, you start with assistants, associates, and university librarians. And so we started with a midpoint of around 12 to 15 years with a factor of 1.0 for our associates, and then we apply it to these other ranks. Okay. And so, um, for every, uh, our midpoint, and this ties back to those averages that I showed you before, um, for our midpoint, um, we have established what the midpoint of our structure based upon an associate is going to be for each of these job types. And it goes up by 4% or down by 4% for associates. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a 9% pay increase. And so we've taken those figures and we've increased each of these uh, by 9%. So, for example, if we were to have a university librarian that was a cataloger, they would make nine, and they had 24 years of experience, they would make 9% more on average than the cataloger um, that's an associate. Um, we uh, distributed down, calculated down the center points of the distributions uh, for these um, types of positions uh, for the assistants, and then we also um, 
continue to use uh, the uh, proportion that's based upon the average salary from the um, uh, from the ARL salary survey uh, to establish the center points for our positions um, for people who are an assistant with less than seven years of experience. We do not have associates with less than seven years of experience, so those columns do not exist in this range. And so um, this information is available to you. Um, you can work backwards how we got to this, and I can tell you that this is the basis that we use to establish salaries. So this is the center point of the average, this is the average salary uh, for our employees um, that uh, had those different types of jobs or experiences. And, and so the implication is that we are now grouping faculty um, not based upon um, their rank solely, but the different types of positions. So our catalogers are compared to other catalogers. And other factors differentiate their actual salary. So if we have a cataloger that is of a different rank or that has foreign language requirements, they're going to be paid differently. Um, second, um, the advanced degrees. Our decision was that we would um, give credit for an advanced degree beyond the required MLS degree, up to a maximum of 5,000. And we also, in order to reflect performance, we uh, decided to retain a 2010 merit increase. And I'll show you these calculations in just a moment. Um, for feasibility, we capped all raises at 18 percent. Um, and for folks who had um, achieved but had not, um, which is a performance evaluation level, um, that, which is not in bad standing but it's not in great standing, that those folks would be capped at a 9 percent. Uh, increase based upon the target for them, and that um, folks who had received a failing evaluation in, uh, with, in the past two years would not be eligible for this round of market equity. They could go up later um, for an individual market equity. So I'm going to show you quickly some examples of these salary calculations. And so in this example, um, and this is available for you, there are five individuals. Uh, and these have been given fictionalized names. They're catalogers. They're merged group. And in the information available to you, um, we start with, for each of these individuals, a fictionalized starting salary. One includes a stipend. Um, and we um, work our way from these calculations. For those individuals, um, for each of these individuals, we established a job class midpoint. And this is based upon an associate with 12 to 15 years. We then apply a foreign language um, credit of 9%, if applicable, and come up with a factor for that. That is their jobs. Those are their job-specific um, compensable factors. Then we take into account their years of experience and their rank modifier. And for this, um, you may remember the 0.79. This is an assistant. They have between zero and three years of experience. So their factor is 0.79. So we apply it to um, the, uh, uh, the salary that was adjusted uh, for foreign language, and we come up with an improved individual target for them that takes into account experience and rank. This person happens to have a PhD, and so we add 5,000 for that. We have other folks who have a second master's, some who have only the required master's, and they receive no adjustment. And so we end up with a salary based upon their education. Then we factor in uh, any merit that they had received. We add that, added that back into the system. And we calculated what um, the salary increase would be and what percentage it was of their current base salary. And um, then we took into account uh, their performance. Uh, if they had an achieves, they were capped at 9%. And so um, you can see in this instance, someone's anticipated salary of, of $5,000 was capped at 4 because that's 9% of their salary. Um, we have instances uh, where um, some folks might have received an increase of over 18 percent, but because that's our maximum, uh, we factored that in. And um, we come up with a final increase uh, for each of these individuals. And it's based upon modular uh, cumulative calculations um, uh, based upon a, a target uh, from the salary structure that I showed you before. And so um, we indicate to people the amount that's that is disqualified, if any. Um, in this instance, we had a person who was over 18 percent. At this point, we had a person who was maxed at 9 percent. And so these are actually how we came up with our market equity targets for these individuals. 
And we communicated to folks um, an actual um, report that showed, to, uh, showed them um, what they um, could anticipate um, receiving. And this is for the individual who was capped at 9%. Um, it goes through all of those things in a slightly different format and explains to them what our target is going to be for that individual. And so the intention was that this created um, transparency. So we have an externally equitable system based upon job type using midpoint point for the ranges. We've applied our geographic region. Um, and we also used years of experience with ranks to differentiate uh, along with special requirements of the position and administrative um, to create internal equity. And we used educational credentials and performance, including past merit and qualifiers. As a result of this, um, basically 64% of the eligible library faculty um, were targeted to receive raises. 25% uh, were already at or above the target. Um, of the 49 targeted to receive raises, um, seven were capped at the 18% because the, the size of the adjustment that was necessary, and seven were capped at nine based upon performance. Um, you can see um, how we actually use this going forward um, for um, search offers. We're still using these figures. I've provided um, an anonymized um, calculation. And one of the other ways that we're maintaining this is in October 2013, we are slated to receive merit and across the board funding. The merit will differentiate people based upon performance um, and we're not going to make an adjustment to our salary structure for that, but we will have a thousand dollar across the board increase and in all of our figures um, we are going to increase by a thousand um, to maintain um, internal equity and we'll use that to hire people to avoid um, either compression or those people being paid inadequately as we bring them in. So basically the across the board we're going to maintain our system by increasing across the board. Uh, lastly, I'm happy to share my references and turn it back over to um, the folks from ARL. Okay, well as we come to the end of the broadcast, I want to thank Judy and Brian for this terrific presentation and to all of you for your participation. There's one remaining webcast in this series on Tuesday, November 5th, which will focus on analyzing age, race, and ethnicity demographics. Uh, the presenters for that webcast will be Stanley Wilder, who's university librarian at the U University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and our colleague here at ARL, Mark Puente, Director of Diversity and Leadership Programs. So this concludes today's ARL webcast. Thank you for joining us, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, everyone.